you visit Napoleon's tomb here at Les Invalides in Paris, you can see enshrined in marble evidence that the Louvre was important to Napoleon. Partout où mon règne a passé, il a laissé des traces durables de son bienfait. I love this. This is this is the celebration of Napoleon's public achievements. It's look upon my works, ye tourists, and be impressed. And on either side is a, is a list of everything that he's achieved as public works. And in the centre of it, there's les travaux du Louvre, the Louvre. Once Napoleon had absolute power in France, he wasted little time in using the Louvre for the purposes of self-promotion. The dictator ordered that the Revolutionary Museum now be called the Musée Napoleon. And he had this mini and first Arc de Triomphe erected here in front of the Louvre on the Carousel as a monument to his martial glory. On top, were beautiful bronze statues of horses plundered from St. Mark's Square in Venice. Friezes celebrated Napoleon's many military campaigns. And there's this inscription dedicated to the Austrian campaign and the decisive French victory at the Battle of Austerlitz. Napoleon put his imprint on walls and ceilings with the letter N and his chosen images of bees and eagles. And he needed a painter to immortalize the most sacred moments of his life in the most sacred spaces. On 18th of December, 1803, a proclamation declared, Nous avons nommé Monsieur David notre premier peintre. Much to the immense self-satisfaction of David, he was now our first painter. And in 1804, we had a job for him. Napoleon made sure that David, his court painter, witnessed the moment that he crowned himself emperor here in Notre Dame on the 2nd of December, 1804. Originally, David had a ringside view for his sketching, but then the master of ceremonies, an aristocrat called Louis-Philippe de Ségur, who was very conscious of class and rank, moved David right up into the galleries, right high up, where he could neither see the procession, nor, crucially, could he see the crowning. But when this happened, David exploded, he went mad, there was a fight, real fisticuffs. And it was only after this punch-up that David got his rightful place back. The rest, of course, is art history, but, you know, talk about an artistic temperament. The finished works in the Louvre. And it's a piece of work on a huge scale. But it's the detail that's important. And this is what preoccupied David and Napoleon when they met to discuss the painting. David captured the moment that Napoleon crowned Josephine Queen, not his own coronation. A kneeling figure was copied from Rubens' coronation of Marie de Medici. And by the way, she's had years taken off her by David's painterly facelift. Originally, David had painted the Pope with his hands folded in his lap until the emperor explained that he hadn't got the pontiff all the way from the Vatican just to sit and do nothing. So David changed this to Pope Pius VII, blessing the coronation. And there's mischief here too. Look at the wily survivor Talleyrand and his turned up nose. This is the man that Bonaparte famously called a piece of shit in a silk stocking. The female figure on the balcony, that's Napoleon's mother, who couldn't stand Josephine and actually wasn't there on the big day. But on instruction, David put her in the picture anyway. And there, of course, sketchbook in hand, is the great artist himself. Despite the success of this painting, there was a prickly relationship between David and the courtiers around the emperor. This picture was meant to be the first of four celebrating the coronation, but the project was never completed after squabbles about money. So it's perhaps no coincidence that in 1806, the great general gave David and fellow painters their marching orders. They had just 24 hours to pack up their studios in the Cour Carré and get out. And when Napoleon married for the second time in 1810, David wasn't asked to record the ceremony when it took place in the Louvre. 
the close relationship between painter and despot was over as their fortunes declined. David to new rivals with new ideas about art, Napoleon to the hubris that led to his fall from power and the return of the Bourbon monarchy. The rule of Napoleon was ended in 1815 with the Battle of Waterloo and the restoration of the Bourbon dynasty was secured. The Louvre was renamed Le Musée Royal and all of the visual propaganda changed too. Out went the Napoleonic N and the bees and the eagles that had been a symbol and in came the image of the lily and the monogram LL for Louis XVIII. And there was other interesting stuff. If you look up here, you can see that this is the face of Napoleon. What happened was that the new king had a wig placed on Bonaparte's head, transforming him into the image of his illustrious forebear, Louis XIV. The Restoration was a challenging period for the Louvre, forced to concede to demands that 5,000 pieces of plundered art be returned. The bronze horses on top of the Arc de Triomphe went back to Venice and were replaced by these grey imitations. Some treasures did remain. The wedding at Cana was kept simply too big to be moved again, the museum argued. An elderly David was now in exile, like his former patron Bonaparte. But a new generation of painters was emerging and producing stunning works of art. One is to be found in the Salle Rouge. This painting, Le Radeau de la Meduse, The Raft of the Medusa, by Jericho, is one of the great treasures of the Louvre. It was the talk of the Salon when it was first exhibited in 1819, and it was very quickly acquired by the then director of the Louvre, the Comte de Faubin. I, I think it's an extraordinary complex painting. It's realistic, but it's not quite real. You've got these human bodies constructed as a kind of pyramid. It's very romantic. It's about human suffering, but also about the impossibility of hope. But what you really feel is that you're in the painting, you're in that pyramid of, of human suffering. And you can see the kind of forensic nature of Jericho's work. He was the kind of man who spent hours in mortuaries and hospitals sketching out dead bodies. And he wasn't even afraid to take home the, the limbs to work out the tricky bits. And that's what makes this painting so stark, so powerful. There was no bigger scandal than the shipwreck of the frigate Meduse off the West African coast, capped in by the hapless Viscount Chaumarie. Of the 147 crew, only 13 survived. This was headline news, and the public lapped up lurid tales of cannibalism and madness. Such a juicy story translated to canvas could only be good for the career of the 20-year-old artist. I asked curator Sebastian Allard about the painting. It was, and has been taken as a form of allegory, since Jericho is depicting a ship that was wrecked as a direct result of the incompetence of its captain. Survivors were stranded on a raft without food, water or hope, and people took all this as an allusion to the French state after the fall of the empire, governed by incompetence. There were more intense, romantic sensibilities at work here. We can see here a taste for rather dark and sinister painting that's in stark contrast to the relatively clear and bright paintings of David, and which of course acts as a tool towards the dramatic effect of the painting. And it's a rather macabre style, with a penchant for death and corpses. As well as bringing the best of contemporary art into the Louvre, these decades of the Restoration saw the arrival from Egypt of mysterious and magical objects that were old, yet very new. On the 25th of October, 1836, the great obelisk behind me here was unveiled. 
It came from a temple in Luxor and was the gift of the Khedif of Egypt. Its original base featured monkeys who had suspiciously large erections and obviously this had to be replaced by something much more austere in granite and fashioned in Brittany. But nonetheless, this latest monument was a great success. And the most important thing was that it announced a new mania in France for all things oriental. The man who arranged the passage of the obelisk to Paris and who brought so much to the story of the Louvre was Jean-Francois Champollion. Now Champollion worked here in the Louvre and he established the superb and stunning collection that we see here today. But not only that, Champollion was the first person to decipher hieroglyphics and in doing so, he invented the science of Egyptology. Inspired by Napoleon's Egyptian campaigns, Champollion devoted his life to understanding this ancient culture. By the age of 16, he knew a dozen ancient languages, and with this extraordinary facility, he began the long task of deciphering hieroglyphs. In 1824, in the Précis du Système Hieroglyphique, Champollion revealed that he had cracked these hidden codes. By this time, Champollion had persuaded the king to buy three private collections for the Louvre, and these were housed in a dedicated Musée Égyptien. When it opened, Champollion wrote an open letter to visitors, saying, I'm thrilled just thinking about what I have to show you. And he was dead right to be thrilled. Along with statues of Egyptian pharaohs, there were religious artifacts and everyday objects. Today, we take these for granted, but in 1826, this was the shock of the new. We should pause to reflect on this moment in our story, because it signals another important transformation for the Louvre. Before, it was a palace with paintings. Now, it's what we recognize properly as a museum full of works of art from all ages and cultures, and a place for scholarly investigation. In its way, this was a cultural revolution. And speaking of revolution, what had happened to the French taste for it? After 15 years of monarchy, the barricades went up in Paris. For three days, between the 27th and the 29th of July, 1830, there was street fighting across the city to challenge the autocratic rule of Charles X. Les Trois Glorieuses, as it was known in revolutionary folklore, is naturally commemorated here with this fine and thrusting monument at Place de la Bastille. But one young French artist wanted to do things his own way to commemorate this July Revolution. He wanted something more sweeping, more daring, something more epic. And what he did is in the Louvre. The 28th of July, Liberty Leading the People by Eugène Delacroix is to be found in the Salle Rouge. In 1830, Delacroix had written to his brother that he was taking on a modern subject, a barricade. If I haven't fought for my country, at least I'll paint for her. The painting that emerged from his studio was the hit of the salon. It's realistic. Delacroix used real people as models to depict real events, but it's also allegorical. There's bare-breasted Marianne, bayoneted musket in one hand, the trickle of flag of the Republic in the other, the personification of liberty and revolution. <laughs> 